be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So that you may live in the land that the 
the Lord is going to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. And thanks be God. God. The song will be read responsibly by four verse. Happy are the, they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are they who observe his decrees and seek him with all their hearts. Who never do any wrong, but always walk in his ways. You lay down your commandments, but then you should go and keep them. Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. And I should not be put to shame when I regard all your commandments. I will thank you in unfeigned heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Do not have a way second lesson is from 1 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still in the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants for whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. But only God gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Ah, yes. Uh, 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, You have heard that it said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be cast into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, where it is the throne of God, or by the earth, where it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, where it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make your one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Granted, earlier in the week you could do that, the better. But uh, 
Looking at the lections means you get a chance to look at the Old Testament reading, the epistle, and the gospel, and uh, to talk about them. The last 22 years or so, I have been part of a Bible study that meets on Friday mornings. It used to be a St. Peter's Bible study, and actually used to meet there. But in one of the great things that came out of COVID, it went to Zoom. And we now have people from about uh, five, six different churches that are part of that Bible study. We generally get about 12 people on a Friday morning. And uh, we also get people from out of state. Right now there's uh, somebody from Indiana who joins us every week. He was kicked out of his own Bible study because he wasn't conservative enough. So we were glad to have him on board. <laughs> because what we do is we really look at the text. We look at it from different angles. We critique it. We're not afraid to ask hard questions ourselves. I find the careful study of the Old and New Testament often illuminates both and shows how much they both have in common. Now I have a tendency to uh, rant and rave about the uh, lectionary and uh, I haven't done that with you yet and I'm running out of opportunities to do that with you. So let me just touch on it briefly today. I uh, often have bones to pick with the people who did the lectionary, often wondering, why? Why did you put this one with that one? And uh, sometimes I uh, wonder about the gospel. Why did they start the gospel there and end it there instead of starting it up here and ending it down here? After all, it's just a snippet, and I hate snippets. So, I'm looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament, and uh, I see so much in common. And every once in a while, someone will come to me and uh, say, make a flat-out statement. It'll be along the lines of the Old Testament God is a God of rules and judgment. And the New Testament God is one of love and forgiveness. Now that sounds like a perfectly reasonable theory on its face. Except for one thing. It's patently false. It's false. And the reason it's false is because it's one God in both books, the same God. And, well, we hear from the prophets in recent weeks. We heard from Isaiah last week and Micah the week before. And they said some very, very gentle things indeed. For example, Micah, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. That's pretty nice. And then we have Jesus in Matthew's Gospel saying that the law as it stands isn't hard enough. We need to make it harder. Now which of the two sounds more judgmental to you? In truth, both sets of scripture are calling us to look beyond the letter to see the spirit. And that's where that big picture comes in. To see the big picture that God sets before us is to really think about what is going on here. <clears throat> the details are there to give us what-if examples. But we need to take that cosmic view to understand that God is offering us, in both Testaments, a way to be, not just a way to do, but a way to be that will enable us to live at peace with ourselves and with our neighbor. Look at the wisdom that God is offering in Jesus. It is one thing not to commit murder or not to commit adultery. These are essentially actions that follow rules. And Jesus is saying there's more to following God than just following rules, just ticking things off. Okay, I didn't do that. I didn't do this. I didn't do this. I must be good. Jesus says internalize with those rules me. Those rules imply something. That's important too. Staying angry out of the moment, and we all get angry, but staying angry out of the moment, bearing grudges, holding something against someone, can lead to a slippery slope. Whether that ultimately leads to murder is another point altogether. The thing is, it's not healthy for us or for whoever it is we're mad at. 
There's no future in it. It doesn't make anything work better for you or for them. There's no peace involved. Ignoring what is in your heart and what is in your life, when you're attracted to someone else, is setting a stage that might well lead to sin and judgment. This business about uh, committing adultery in your heart, I mean, that's, that's what that's about. It's not, uh, it's not designed to make life more difficult. It's designed to make you just think with a little bit broader context than thou shalt not commit adultery. That's, shut that one off the list. I'm okay, I'm safe. No, not if you're thinking about it all the time. Perhaps the hardest thing he had to say today, <clears throat> and I think it certainly is, is the one about divorce. It doesn't seem to work in our day and age. We know so many of the reasons why a divorce may be preferable to a couple staying together. It may indeed be the only good option. But again, the overview is to know ourselves as well as the other insofar as we can. Now, I've counseled many couples, and uh, one of my goals in counseling, premarital counseling, is to see to it that they truly understand what they're about, as well as what the other person is about. I don't want to contribute to the divorce rate, which is already 50%. And uh, I think, by and large, I can safely say I'm well under that. But uh, be that as it may, in the first century, a certificate of divorce was a means of survival for a woman. It was uh, a way for a woman with no other options to seek security in another husband. When women, women had limited options and men were concerned about their heirs and who they really were, and with no knowledge of psychology, sexuality, or gender, such as we know today, it was considered a humane option. And that's why it was written into the Torah. But uh, Jesus seems to say no to divorce in a way that has caused great anguish because several branches of Christianity have taken it to mean no under any circumstances, regardless of the pain that it's caused, the heartache it may cause, the death it may cause. I was taught in pastoral care that when a marriage is death producing rather than life producing, it is no longer a marriage. And therefore, divorce is nothing more than something that says these people have to go their separate ways. Between honest souls with no hidden agendas, are the, that's the basis for a relationship that should last forever. Honest souls with no hidden agendas. People who truly know each other and want to live together anyway. He says to falsely swear is bad, but it's better not to swear at all. Swear in this case, take a vow or an oath. In a plain spoken honest person, their words should be sufficient. And there are minor sects of Protestants to this day who do not swear and will not swear. They simply say yes or no. And the law even recognizes those people if they're truly members of those denominations. The critique of the commandments that Jesus offers is always getting underneath, behind, and above whatever the one on paper means. It's really taking it apart and saying, it's not enough to just follow the rules. He's not interested in people who simply and blandly follow the rules, who check the boxes. I knew somebody once who used to go to church every Sunday without fail, wouldn't consider missing church. But six and a half days a week, this was one of the most miserable people you ever saw. <laughs> Checking boxes doesn't work. And that's what we're not about. What we want to do is strive for the right. Strive to be right. Try to understand the rules that point to a better way of living. 
That's precisely what he's talking about with these critiques. Neither Testament dismisses the idea of a loving God who wants the best for us. But they do offer many examples of people doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason. They illustrate what not to do as a way of pointing in a direction where we don't just do what is right, but we seek a way to be in the right. Right actions and right being in the sight of God. That is the road to that happiness that is spoken of but so eloquently in Deuteronomy, where all will go well for you in the land that I have given you. That's what lies before us, understanding the big picture and knowing what it's about, not mindlessly trying to follow every little rule down to the tiniest bit. Right actions, right being in the sight of God. What's in your heart always triumphs and is always more significant than what you're checking off on a list. Cedar Home and his wife Ruth, 
Lydia Cedrone, Cheryl, Dan, Dorothy, Peggy Downs, Peggy Elkins, Rich Bell, David Fieldhouse, Claudette Force, Tom Golovich, the Hallowell and Armstrong family, <coughs> Heather, Morgan O'Brien family, JC, JD, Jeanette, Jeffrey, Joan, Scott Johnson, Julia, Deborah Cat Roy, Lance, LW, Kevin McKenzie, Sandy McGee, Molly Madden, Kathy McGowan, Michael, Becky Miller, Jim Murphy, Tan, Steve Newman, Vicki Omen, Joseph Albert, Cheryl Pappas, Katia Papalta, John Roboa, Brian Smith, Jamie Souza and family, Walter Thorpe, Bill and Jan Walsh, and Vicki Webweiser. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for the calling of our new director, Brett Johnson. We will exalt you, O God our King. And praise your name forever and ever. <coughs> we pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Today we especially remember Dot Crowett, in whose loving memory the altar flowers are given today. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. To the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins for our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Christ, it's good that we can be together on this uh, sixth Sunday of Epiphany and uh, wrestle with difficult readings and all that. A director who doesn't remember to read the gospel. <laughs> you got one, though. You've got a new record coming in four weeks. <laughs> and that is terrific. Uh, Arthur, we care to say a little more about that. And Keith. And Keith, yes, Keith. Thank you. 
you so much for actually being here. We'll, we'll be celebrating <laughs> We'll be celebrating Van in a few weeks before he leaves, and then uh, we'll celebrate Brett. Then celebrate Brett. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one thing. Yes, no, please. I just wanted to ask this. Um, so Amy and Catherine and Faye, Amy Forsyth, uh, have found wonderful tenants to, who are going to move into the 272 first floor. And they did an immense amount of work on that apartment and renovating it and getting it up to, up to the bar. So, so to have some folks move in there, that sounds like they're going to be great. This is really wonderful news. And so I want to go with that. So things come together eventually. <laughs> we're patient because we're always on God's time, not our time. And sometimes that seems interminable, but then it all comes together. And it has come together in a big way. So that is great. We'll continue in a few moments with Eucharistic Prayer C. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. <clears throat> Again and again you called us to return, 
prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood you have reconciled us, by his wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all those in every generation, who look to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ did die and rose again for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith. The next day.
eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the blessing of the God of Abraham and Sarah, and of his son Jesus Christ, daughter of the son of our, our sister Mary, and the Holy Spirit, which broods over the world as a mother over her children, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.